All right, in this video, we are going to use a TI-84 graphing calculator to approximate the real zeros as well as the relative maxima and minima of the following polynomial function. Here's our function. I already have the real zeros listed here, but I'm going to show you how to find them. And then we have our local max. Um, that's not really written as an ordered pair, but nonetheless, that's our local max. This is our local min. Relative max, local max, relative min, local min, they mean the same thing. It's just like two different ways of saying the same thing. So let's go ahead and have a look on the TI-84. You can do something very similar for the TI-83. Go over to Y equals, type in your function, make sure everything's typed in correctly. All right, and something I always do when I graph a function, I go to zoom and six and I see if it looks nice. And if I'm trying to find zeros, this is going to be just fine. Assuming that you have some idea of, of how these powers work, the fifth power, that's the biggest power we have. That is the degree of our polynomial. The most number of real zeros that we can have is going to be five. In this case, we only have three, though. If we were to zoom out just to get a quick look, this curve, wait till it pops up, this curve does shoot off forever up upward over here and it shoots forever downward here. So the only three x-intercepts, the only three zeros we have are those three that we see on the standard screen. So let's go ahead and find them and we're going to get these three answers right here. I'm going to zoom in on this so we can see it better. And let's start, it don't matter which one you start finding first. Let's just start with this one over here and I'm going to show you two different ways to get the zero. Second trace, let's go to number two. So we're calculating the zero. And what a lot of folks do is they just use the arrows to scroll around. We want to be to the left of this x-intercept, of this zero here. So if I press the left arrow on the calculator and I just keep on going, keep on going, this is not the way I prefer to do it all the time, but nonetheless, I still do use it every once in a while. So here, it's flashing, is to the left of where it crosses. Now if I press the left arrow again, that cursor has just shot way up here and it's at negative two comma 15. Well, there's negative two 15. It's way on up here somewhere, negative 2.3-ish actually. That's still to the left. Right there is still to the left. You don't wanna get your left bounds and your right bounds mixed up, but that right there flashing is to the left barely of where it crosses the x-axis. I'm gonna press enter right there. All right, it threw up a vertical line. I'm gonna we'll talk about this vertical line in a minute too to help you better understand what the calculator's doing. But now it's asking for right bound. Let's come down here to the right. This flashing cursor is to the right of where it crosses the x-axis. I'm gonna press enter. And then throw up another vertical line. These vertical lines are real close together, but I'm gonna make this make more sense in a minute. For now, let's just press enter on guess. And notice we do get a zero um, of that one right there. So the negative 2.1178 and that's exactly what that is if we round um, to the correct decimal place. All right, so let's get the other two, zero. Now, it looks like it definitely crosses right through the origin, and as a matter of fact, it does. Well, let's, let me show you that. Going to second trace, go to number two for zero, and instead of doing the scroll technique, here's what I like to do. I like to find where it crosses, and if I can visually see a x value clearly to the left of where it crosses, and if I can see a x value clearly to the right of where it crosses, I just type those values in. For example, um, if I go to window, notice my x scale, x scale is one. What this means is each little tick mark on the x axis represents one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Over here, it means negative one, negative two, negative three. All right, so let me redo that command one more time since um, I lost that when I went to the window screen, but the left bound right here, since this thing looks like it crosses somewhere around zero, negative one is definitely to the left of where this curve crosses the x-axis. So I'm going to type in negative one. You can type in your bounds. So notice it draws a vertical line through x equals negative one. And notice this arrow is pointing to the right. Now it's asking for a right bound. How about positive one? So if I type in a positive one, press enter, now we have two vertical lines. Here's what the calculator is really doing. When you go to calc zero, when you go to find an x-intercept, that's really what this is doing here, these two vertical lines, and then we have two arrows pointing at each other, the calculator is looking in between these two vertical lines. Notice they're pointing at each other because you did left bound and right bound, and it's going to look for the zero in between those two vertical lines. It's going to look for the x-intercept. So on guess, we press enter, and it's going to give us that one right there. So x equals zero is yet another zero of our function. There we go. And now let's do the same thing with this last one here. 
let's type in our bounds because I think that's faster versus having to scroll because you can lose that cursor sometimes when you're scrolling and then it's hard to get it to show back up. So second trace, go to number two. And again, you can scroll if you'd like, but let's count. One, two, three. Clearly this curve crosses somewhere between two and three. Heck, it crosses somewhere between one and three. So anything to the left of where it crosses, and I don't want to go way back here though. I mean, I want to stay somewhat close to it. That way I'm not going to confuse the calculator into finding these. But one, if I type in one for my left bound, boom, there's my vertical line. There's the arrow pointing in this direction here. So now let's just put another one on the right side, the right bound. So we got one, two, three, definitely three. X equals three is going to be to the right of where this function crosses the x-axis. Notice our two vertical lines, the x-intercept is in between them. Let's press enter on guess, and now you can see that we do have that 2.2183817, and they just rounded it right here. So that's how we find zeros. Whether you prefer to scroll or type in your bounds, you will get the same answer either way. Now what about the local maxes and local mins, or what the problem refers to them as relative max and mins? These are where we have our high points, our low points, hence maximum, minimum. But notice we, it's kind of hard to see those. Actually, we can't see them at all. The minimum is going to be down here somewhere. The maximum is going to be up here somewhere. A couple of options you can do here. Um, you can zoom out, but that's going to make the graph look real clustered up. We can go to zoom fit, which is going to be zoom zero, that one right there. And sometimes this will give you a better looking curve. Now, I don't like that either. I'm not going to lie to you. The reason why, I don't see it dip down and come back up and then come back down. So that, that's not a good option in this case. But sometimes zoom fit does work great. Let me go back to zoom six. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to mess around with the window. Uh, you, you need to learn how to operate all these various pieces um, to manipulate your graph on the TI-83, TI-84. So you can solve problems such as ones that we're doing right here. I'm going to go to window. And notice, okay, I'm going to set my X min to a negative three. I'm going to set my X max to a positive three. Let's see what happens there. That's not going to help me in this problem, but since I'm already talking about it, I'm going to show you what the graph's going to do. So we're getting rid of a lot, all the values of bigger than three for X and all the values of X that are less than three, we're getting rid of them. We're just going to look between negative three and three. So if I go back to my graph, notice this is already starting to look a little bit smoother, a little bit more curved. Now what we need to do is make our Y max bigger and our Y min even smaller. That way we can see the actual curve up here. So I'm gonna go to window. I won't change my Y min, uh, let's go like negative 50. That might be too much, but it'll be all right. Y max, let's go to positive 50. You don't have to make these the same or exact opposites or anything like that. But here we go. Let's see what this looks like. I love it. We clearly see a minimum, we clearly see a maximum. All right, and remember, I never changed my X scale. My X scale is still one. That's going to be very helpful when I do left bounds and right bounds for these maxes and mins. So let's go to, let's find the minimum. Let's find this one right here. So second, trace, let's go to minimum number three. And now, yes, you can do this. Left bound, put this flashing cursor to the left of where that minimum occurs, because we're calculating the minimum. This has nothing to do with the zeros anymore. So there's one, so I'm going to press enter. I'm going to go to my right bound because that's what, exactly what the calculator is telling me to do. Right bound. And notice we have those same vertical lines, except now we're not calculating zero, we're calculating the minimum. What this is going to do, the calculator is going to look in between these two vertical lines and it's going to find the absolute lowest point, local minimum. So let's press enter on guess. And as you can see here, we do have a local minimum of negative 23.46176, and it occurs at x equals negative 1.39986. And as you can see, that's exactly what we have right here. So this is the minimum, and where does it occur at? So the minimum is the y value, where it occurs at is the x value. And notice those numbers rounded off give us those two exact pieces right there. Now, we can also type in the bounds for this one as well. So let me make this full screen, and let's go to second, trace, let's go to maximum. So instead of us having to scroll, remember this was one, this was two, this is three. Remember how we made our X max three? But notice one is to the left of this max, and three is to the right of this max. So I'm gonna type in one for my left bound, boom. 
I'm going to type in three. Nope. Well, three would work just fine. I'm going to type in a two, though. Boom. There's our two vertical lines. We have a max in between these two vertical lines. So let's press enter on guess, and we should be getting that other one. So 1.495 and 27.657, or whatever we need to round to. And that's exactly what we have here. 27.657, that is the maximum. That is the Y value. And it occurs when X is approximately uh, 1.495, which is what I was just talking about a moment ago. So, um, yeah, there you have it. You know, three commonly used things when graphing functions. Finding the zeros, finding some maximums, finding some minimums. And that's all we had to find here for this example. Again, the TI-83 techniques are very similar. Adjusting windows, zooming, and all of that stuff. And yeah, there you have it. That's how you can find a max, a min, um, and some real zeros on a graphing calculator. And that is it for this video. I hope it helps.